and as Joe mentioned, I graduated in 2002, and I had a, a wonderful experience here in uh, high school. And I was also part of the, the famous Hill, right? And so we had we had put up 2002, and I see today that it's still being recrafted and reconstructed. Has anybody participated or gone up on the hill at all? No, oh, no hands. Okay, good kids, good kids. Joe, you got some good kids here, so that's great. <laughs> Uh, so a little mischievous stuff, uh, but it was great. Uh, it's a little steep hill too as well. Uh, but anyways, uh, I also used to MC the rallies. I had a lot of fun in high school, and so it's great to be back here and to share you know, my knowledge and my experience, which is just one of many uh, to kind of encourage you and to think about your future. And so you know, before I begin, I want to think about, you know, I'm gonna talk to you today about my own life, and you're gonna have different experiences from other speakers that come across. But what I also want to do is to really try to reach out and talk to you about formal education in college and some of the obstacles and challenges, but also some of the opportunities that you can look for when you're going to school. And so today, I mean, I could just talk to you about my life, and which is, I, I will spend a little bit of time talking to you about my research, but really my goal is to kind of inspire you and reach out and really think about your future, because you know, you're at this kind of transitional period, your seniors, most of your seniors, or some of you are juniors or sophomores, and you know, it's not for you to really think about college as much um, until you really get into the perspective. And so today, I want to accomplish that. But before I begin, so we can, um, I want to talk to you about, you know, when we think about success, or we think about, you know, we also think about happiness, but there's a lot of different ways we can think about happiness. And so for some of you, it may be a relationship that you have, or your family, uh, or it may even be, you know, really cute uh, puppies, as we see here, uh, that really make you happy and satisfied. And so if, if I was to give you a talk today about happiness, you would think about all these kind of different attitudes. But really today, I want to talk to you about education and how that can also mean a different type of happiness. Because a lot of your life growing up, you will spend in the workforce. And so if we just look... Um, at a couple quotes, and this is one that I really like from Steve Jobs, the former uh, CEO of Apple, and I'll just kind of read this if you can, before I can just read this to you. If you look at the first part, it says your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And so you're gonna be working a lot part of at your everyday life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And if you haven't found it out, keep looking. Right? Don't settle. And again, this is really geared towards kind of a business attitude and thinking about how you can be an entrepreneur. But I think this quote really resonates and really gives you an opportunity to think about how you can perceive everything in life. And so I think when we think about happiness or we think about other things, we kind of treat them as mutually exclusive. But I will talk to you today about how we can think about school in relationship. And so if we look at just kind of, you can go forward. So if we look at just your daily life, and if you sleep you know, for eight days, you work for eight days, you really have kind of eight hours, or eight hours, you really have eight hours of, oh, yeah, okay, going okay. <laughs> you really have eight hours of kind of fun and activity in your life, but really, if you treat your work, your workplace where you're at at least eight hours a day, if we take the kind of 40 hour standard work day, um, you really can treat that workplace as your life and success too as well. And so a lot of my discussion today is really trying to get you to think deeply about you know, college or formal education, but also you know, happiness in life uh, when you come out of high school. And so you know, I can remember sitting exactly where all of you were sitting here in the auditorium, and we used to have things like career days. And people would come in and they would talk about their work. And I remember walking away thinking, okay, well that's, you know, it's a really nice story. I learned something that was very interesting. But really what I want to do today is to really have you walk away with something that you've learned and something that you can actually apply to your life. And so when we think about education in college, you know, what is that? What does that mean? And so a lot of your parents or your teachers are going to strongly, you know, stress you, you got to go to college, you got to go to college. And I can remember when I was sitting in your seat as a senior, thinking, okay, I should go to college, but really what should I do? And I was kind of confused on really one, what college meant, but two, you know, what, what did it mean for my direction? And I remember, you know, I had brothers and sisters who would, you know, that had gone to college and they had talked a little bit about it, but I really had no clue in what I was getting into. 
And so today I really want to talk to you about that pathway. And so when you think about it, and if we can go to the next slide, you know, if we think about this kind of linear projection, you'll have, again, your teachers and your parents tell you, you know, the road to success or the road to your future is following this pathway. And if we think about it, we can think about this real nice meadow field where you're walking across the straight path and you'll reach your goal. But really in life, there's always going to be bumps and bruises and things that happen that are going to make you go different directions. And so if you can look at any person and any any individual that has gone either through college or has been successful, and it's never that clear straight pathway that, that they've gone through. And so you should always keep that in the back of your mind as you move forward. And so if we can go to the next. So let me tell you a little bit about my life when I was you know, getting here, I was leaving from Rio Creo and going into uh, college. And so for me, I really never had, you know, kind of a drive or a passion to really go far and do anything in life until I had a, a teacher here, uh, Mr. Deacons. Is, it, is, it, is Mr. Deacons still here? Yeah. yeah, okay, great. So I I didn't really care much about history, the subject of history, and I always hated history because you had to memorize dates and it just wasn't really interesting to me. And then the first day I had Mr. Deacon's class, he said, we're not going to, we're not so concerned with memorizing dates. And we would do simulations, so we would reenact the Industrial Revolution or World War II, or we'd do the stock market. Uh, and it was really thought-provoking, and so I thought, you know, that's a, that's a teacher that I want to be, and I, I think it was very inspirational. So if you have people in your life, then you should really latch on to that and as you move forward. And so for me, when I was leaving high school, I went and I applied at the Santa Rosa Junior College. And you know, there's a lot of mixed feelings about what people think about a junior college. And if I can just get a, sh a raise of hands, is anybody going to the, the JC next year? Okay, so we got a couple of hands. Is anybody going to other colleges, uh, universities throughout California? If you get a raise of hand. Okay, so some of you, so it's kind of a mixed crowd. Well, when I was going, when I was thinking about going to school, the JC kind of had a little bit of a taboo. There was, there was many people who were thinking, well, you know, you'll just go a couple of years, you won't really amount to much in life. And it was really discouraging for a lot of us that were sitting in the, the same similar auditorium as you are today. And so I thought, well, okay, well, I'm just gonna continue to go to school and I'll try to figure it out. And so this is kind of a pathway. Oh, actually, if you go back. <laughs> this is kind of a pathway of my life. And so my trajectory started with my interest in history that kind of formed into, I was really got interested in photography, and then I started thinking about, okay, well, how can I apply history and photography to relative life in, in current events? So I really got into political science, and then I was really fascinated by the relationship of individuals and international relations. And so basically my curiosity is what drove my ambition, because I didn't really have a lot of ambition when I first started. And so if we look at this projection, and then I ended up working at what I do now is in public health. Um, it, it's just one example to illustrate how all of our lives are, you know, they don't follow that straight path that everyone tells you to go across. And so really every example you can point to has kind of these bumps and bruises and has different trajectories. And so we can go forward. So now let me talk to you a little bit about school and educate you a little bit about the cost of school and why you know, there's some mixed feelings about why you should get an education and how, why you should go to college. So if we just look at this simple graph, this is the annual salary of college here at the JC compared to state schools and, and UC. So if we look at Santa Rosa Junior College, for an annual year, you could pay $1,200 and you can have take a full load and get a bunch of credits towards college. Well, if you go to a state school like San Francisco State or San Jose State or Chico State, you can see it's almost six times amount of money. It's about 6,500. And then if you go to a UC school like UCLA or UC San Francisco or UC Berkeley, UC Davis, uh, you can see it's about 13,000. So you can see the disparity between uh, education. And, then, and if I was to give a talk to you about you know, the ins and outs about all of this, you know, we could go into details about what, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of you afterwards but it's really to get you to think about you know, what is the cost of education and how that applies when you're thinking about you know, your future. If we go to the next slide. So this is also one very discouraging stat that a lot of students have, have come across. And so a lot of students to afford college because it's becoming increasingly difficult, uh, walk away with enormous student debt. 
And so when you graduate with a bachelor's degree, on average, students are paying $40,000 in debt that they owe to the government for the loans that they've taken out. And if you go on to go further education to get a master's, on average, you're paying about 60,000. And then if you go on to get a doctorate, you're gonna pay 80,000. Now, if you were to stop, step back and to look at this, and you would take a snapshot, you would say, okay, well, this is the reason why I don't wanna to go to college. Look at how expensive it is. Look at how much debt I'm going to get into. But that's really the wrong attitude to really think about. Because there are opportunities and advancements of thinking about your education. And really, it is an investment. Um, and so it can be very daunting to look at some of these numbers, and I'm not the one to say it's not a challenge, but I want to talk to you today about some of these opportunities that you can overcome some of these challenges of college in pursuing that life. So if for, for some of you that are going to the Santa Rosa Junior College, uh, they have this thing called the Doyle Scholarship. And so I want to talk to you about scholarships and grants that can help pay for some of your education and it really attracts some of the burdens that students pay. So if we think about the Doyle Scholarship is a scholarship that this gentleman actually endowed for the city of Santa Rosa for all students to go to school. And so when I started at the JC, my story, I basically went to school for free. And the Doyle Scholarship still gives you that opportunity to basically go to school for free. So if you look here, it gives you about $2,000. All you need is about a 2.75 uh, GPA in high school. And then all you have to do is apply. And there's nothing that hurts for applying. And so if we go to the next slide, and we see, um, you know, there's a deadline that's occurring right now. So if today is October 7th, if we look just right here, you really should be thinking about your future and trying to apply for these scholarships. So you may be thinking today, oh, well, I'm not gonna go to the JC, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm not really interested, but I really encourage you to go talk to counselors, talk to your teachers, talk to your parents, and go look at the website, talk to the people at the JC, and, and fill out this application. Because if you get the scholarship, it just sits there. And if you don't use it, you don't. it's not that you lose it, you at least have given yourself that opportunity. So there's a lot of opportunities with many scholarships and grants out there. And so if we go to the next slide and we think about this, my own story really is starting from the JC and going to a state school, San Francisco State, and then going on to a UC at UC Santa Cruz. And I did not have the opportunity, so my parents did not have you know, the money to give me to go to college, but really by, by not giving me the money, made me work a little bit harder and made me search for other opportunities that were out there. And so if we look at scholarships and grants, there are all kinds of scholarships and grants out there. So there's just a lot of people who have investments and interests on giving you students the opportunity to go to school for free. So a lot of these are based on uh, your merits, so the, your GPA, your scores, but also there are some that are on uh, you know, your sports scholarships. But really what you should be thinking about is how this could help you go through school. But what was also really, uh, really surprising is when I went to the JC, I had asked, just simply asked, just asking a person, you know, what scholarships could be for me? Because I wasn't much of an athlete. My, my GPA was, was pretty good, but not great. So I went to the JC and they have these, these uh, whole catalog of scholarships that they offer. And believe it or not, they have scholarships from, you know, if you have red hair, or if you're five foot three, or if you're, you know, one sixteenth Italian or Jewish, um, there are so many opportunities out there that you should really be, you know, asking about. So again, I'm just one source to tell you this. And if you don't believe me, you know, your constant attitude should be, you know, should I go talk and research and talk to other people? And so really, even though there is this burden out there for cost, there are opportunities that we can look at. We go to the next slide. So in addition to having scholarships that help pay for school, there are also employers out there that actually provide programs that will pay for your college. I know it sounds crazy, but it's really true. And so when I was going through school, I heard from a, a, one of my friend's girlfriends that she was working at Bank of America. And I never thought that I was gonna go work at Bank of America, but she said, you should go work there because they offer this program called tuition reimbursement. And I go, well, what's that? Well, tuition reimbursement, they would subsidize and pay for your tuition after you pay those costs. 
So when I transferred from, remember the SRJC, which was only about $1,000 a, a, a year, to San Francisco State, and was, which is a state school, which is about $6,000, I really didn't have the money to go you know, get into debt, or I could have went to debt, but I didn't have the money to pay for that. But by working at Bank of America, they basically paid for my entire tuition. So there are other employers out there, Wells Fargo, Kaiser, uh, Home Depot, you really should just go around and ask any person that you know and ask them if they have these kind of programs because they can really assist you in going through school. So we go to the next one. So really, if, if you are with the attitude and I'm trying to you know, promote this idea of going to school and college, and let's just say, you know what, you know what, Eric, I'm not gonna go to school. I, it's just, I'm not good in the academic setting. I don't, I just don't do good on tests. It's just not for me, and that's okay, you know? Happiness is more important. So if happiness is you know, something else that you wanna do in life, that's great. But you never wanna have regrets in life. And so really, you should train your mind to think, okay, I'm not gonna go to a formal education, but what am I gonna do with my life? And you can hear this, if you don't believe me, go talk with anybody about their work. And there's always, you get the really two different responses. The people who love their work, that can't stop talking about it, like myself, and we're happy every day about what they do and never looking at the clock, looking at the clock where, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time in the day what I gotta do. And then the other kind of people where when you ask them about what they do in their job, they will give you a very, you know, very disparaging and, and, and disclassified reality of what they do and thinking about, you know, they're very unhappy or they have to work late or they don't like their coworkers. And really, you don't want to have that in your life because it really brings down your happiness. So it's all kind of related. So really, this is another way to think about, you know, if you don't want to go to a formal education, that's fine. But really think about developing, you know, your skill sets and what's going to separate you from getting a job and, 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 and from other aspects of life. And so I study, or I actually teach international relations and global politics at San Francisco State. And we have a bunch of international students and I always tell them that you know, in life, the world is becoming more globalized and competition is increasing. So you have to separate yourself from others of what your skill set is. Otherwise, you're going to end up working at places that may be you know, less satisfying or less you know, unhappy in your life. So really you should think about if you're not gonna go the formal education route, what other pathways? Again, remember, there's not just one way to do anything. It's not just that linear path that certain parents or certain teachers have told you, but there are multiple uh, pathways to success and happiness in life. And that's what I really want you to take away today, if we can go forward. So let me just spend a little bit of time in telling you about my own research and what I do uh, when we think about kind of public health. So I study tobacco control. And a lot of times people, when we think about tobacco, the, the, the sentiment, the feeling is that, okay, well, yes, we know tobacco is bad for you and it's harmful. And, and the reality is it's a slow, very painful death. And if we look just globally, and I think this illustration uh, or this graphic illustrates the point that over time, we see just a global explosion of cigarettes that are smoked throughout the world. And this is a really big problem because Tobacco is the leading preventable cause of death in the world. So if we go to the next slide. So if we just compare tobacco, and if you think about, okay, well, how do people die? Or how do people get sick in life? If you added up all the gun violence, the, the wars that happen in the world, the alcohol, um, drugs, kidnaps, murders, obesity, if you added it all together, it still does not equal tobacco. That's how big of an epidemic that tobacco is. So thinking about tobacco, I had no idea. So I started working at UCSF and really got interested in kind of you know, advancing public health, but thinking about you know, global politics and intertwining it. So we go to the next page. So again, this is just another statistic to show you that in the 20th century, that there was 100 million people that died from tobacco. And in this century, it is going to be one billion people worldwide that will die from tobacco smoke. So it's a really big issue, not only here in the United States, but globally as we think about it. So what I study is packaging and, and tobacco advertising. And so if we look at packaging over the years, what we have here in the United States is just your plain package of Marlboro that communicates 
to young people, especially yourselves, you know, these really appealing images. But over time, we can see that the tobacco package itself, we, we can go to the next page, has really evolved over time. And so I examine and I look at how these policies, the specific policy of tobacco package labeling, has really helped young people from not beginning to smoke, but also discouraging those people who are already smokers. And so if you can see, you know, if you were to buy that Marlboro package again, what we sell here in the United States, it's a very appealing image. I mean, if we look at, you know, the really nice design and the marble, it's known throughout the world. But look at if you go all the way to these really graphic images, all the way to what was called plain packaging, I mean, this is just something I, I would not buy. I mean, it's very repulsive, but it also communicates the harmful effects of smoking. So for me, as most people, I thought smoking was, okay, it affected your lungs and you get lung cancer. But really tobacco gives you foot disease, gonorrhea, mouth disease, uh, messes with your cardiovascular and your health and your heart. And so really if we think about tobacco, it has these multiple problems. And if we go to the next slide, if we think about the top brands in the world, you all know about Apple, you know about uh, Coca-Cola. But really, if we look at the number 10 brand in the world is Marlboro. And so you can see the power that this branding association attracts, especially to young people and thinking about smoking. We go to the next. So I basically do research uh, in this archive library uh, at UCSF where they have these former tobacco industry documents that uh, were basically leaked out from the tobacco companies lying to the public about the addictive nature of nicotine and how people were smoking. And so I used this research and all the grants and the funding that I got to finish my PhD and to go on to meet with policymakers and do a bunch of research on tobacco control. So if we go to the next page. So I was able, to, with grants and with scholarships, I was able to travel and meet very dignified policymakers. So being in political science, but also being in public health. And so this is a picture of me with the president of Uruguay, which was a great experience, and also the health minister of Australia. So not only did I get to you know, travel and do all the kind of ambitious things that I wanted to do, which made me happy, but I also got to make a difference in the world and help those countries that are trying to enact these public health policies. So if we can go forward. Um, and then as a result of that, there was a lot of interest in my dissertation work. And so John Oliver, who has a show on HBO, did a whole skit on tobacco that's basically based on my dissertation. A lot of people got really interested in my work and they talked about it a lot. And it really shows how corporations try to attack different governments that are implementing these policies. Can we go forward? So what I'm also researching now at UCSF is the effect of sugar. And so a lot of you, you know, being young as you are, including myself, I was addicted to, much like my parents' generation addicted to cigarettes, I was really addicted to sugar and really addicted to soda. I used to drink a couple of sodas a day. I didn't really know the, the health effects of it. But now I've learned that really, you know, when we look at soda, there's, there's this amazing amount of sugar that we don't know about, that is hidden in a lot of these packages. So I think these visuals illustrate Again, not just with soda, but with things like juice or Gatorade or things that have been sold to us really deceptively by the food and beverage industries, you know, basically to make a profit, but at the expense of our own public health. And so when we think about, you know, tobacco as being harmful, sugar is another, what we call a non-preventable disease, non-preventable disease that we can actually prevent by stopping, but it's a very addictive substance. And so a lot of my current research looks at a different, uh, municipalities and states that are trying to pass laws that put taxes on sugar. So if we go to the next page, and hopefully, you know, kind of reveal some of those really appealing brands. And so they've done really amazing studies to show, you know, you talked about kind of the Pepsi and Coke challenge. Well, they've done even Pepsi Coke with some unbranded cola like this. And they had people, you know, students test it. And they really picked this soda actually more than, you know, the Pepsi or the Coke to illustrate that Really, you don't need necessarily the branding uh, for the Coke or the Pepsi, so really we should remove it to try to help those who are drinking too much. 